In this video, we're going to quickly derive a formula for finding the area bounded by a curve given in parametric form. And then we're going to apply that formula to the picture you see below where we're finding the area bounded by one bump on a cycloid curve. Just a quick reminder, if I'm giving a parametric curve, it means I give you a x as a function of t together with a y as a function of t. And I have some range on the values of t, starting from t1 and ending at t2. A quick sketch of the graph might look something like this in general where this moment on the curve is T1, and this moment on the curve is T2. And the area I'm interested in looks something like this. So we take a pretty standard approach to this. The idea is to just slice the area into ribbons that are so thin, the area is well approximated by a rectangle. And I normally call that a differential area contribution of dA. Well, the area of that is just the height times the width. We're sitting at some arbitrary moment in time that I'll call t, and the height of this rectangle is y of t, and the width is differential, and I'll call that a little dx. Now I can just play a little game with the differentials and say that since x is defined as a function of t, I should be able to write dx as dx dt times dt, in other words, x prime of t dt. So writing down the area of my little area contribution, dA, that's going to be y of t, that's the height, times x prime of t dt, that's the width. To find the total area, you sum up all the area contributions, and I get the sum of all those contributions as t goes from t1 to t2, y of t, x prime of t dt, and that's our new formula for computing the area bounded by a curve defined parametrically. Okay, now let's apply our new formula to this cycloid bump shown below. It's given by these somewhat complicated parametric equations. So let's start with x prime of t. I differentiate the t and I get 1, and then minus 2 sine t over 2. So the sine is going to differentiate to cosine. Don't forget about the chain rule here. You have to multiply by the derivative of t over 2, which is 1 half. That's going to cancel out that 2. So x prime is 1 minus cosine t over 2. When I look at my integral now, y of t is 2 minus 2 cosine t over 2. x prime is 1 minus cosine t over 2. And this produces a non-trivial trigonometric integral. So I'm going to pull a factor of 2 out in front, just to clean things up a little bit. And I end up with 1 minus cosine t over 2, all squared. But I may as well leave it in expanded form to make it easier to expand. When I expand these terms, I end up with 1 minus 2 cosine t over 2. Both of those are easy to integrate. And then the third term is not easy to integrate, so it's cosine squared t over 2. So to deal with the cosine squared term, I have to use the identity that cosine squared of an angle is 1 half times the quantity 1 plus cosine of twice the angle. So I'm going to plug that in in the next step. All right, I just realized I lost my factor of 2 out in front. No big deal. There it is. I'm going to combine my constants now. It's 1 plus a half. That's 3 halves. And then I have these trig components. And I'm going to get really sneaky with this integral. So I notice with this first cosine. Um, it doesn't have a period of 2 pi. It has a period of 4 pi because there's a 1 half in front of the t. Um, just to verify that real quick, if you replace t with 4 pi, you get cosine of 2 pi, meaning that it just completed its first wiggle. Well, this is a sinusoidal function with a midline along the x-axis. And that means if I integrate over exactly one period, all the positive area contributions are going to exactly cancel the negative ones. So by a periodicity argument, I can say that this must integrate to 0. What about this piece, the cosine of t from 0 to 4 pi? Well, that's a cosine function with a period of 2 pi. And I have exactly two periods of it. So it spends exactly as much time above the x-axis as it does below. That, too, integrates to 0. If you feel a little bit skeptical about that technique, go ahead and integrate these terms. And they just give you sine functions that when you evaluate across the limits of integration, are going to give you 0 minus 0 in the limit. So the only surviving term that I have here is my integral of 3 halves, which is just 3 halves t. And then I evaluate from 0 to 4 pi. 
and that gives me 3 times 4 pi, which is 12 pi. So there's our area for the cycloid. Now one thing I like to do with a definite integral like this, especially with an exotic curve, is just try to estimate to make sure that answer makes sense. So 12 pi, well pi is a little more than 3, so 12 pi is a little more than 36. And I'm going to just very roughly attempt to draw a rectangle that has basically the same area as the entire cycloid. And that looks like a little bit of an overestimate, but I was trying to balance the parts where I was overestimating and underestimating, just roughly speaking. And this grid might be hard to see, but that's about 3 right there, and that's 12 right there. And the area of that rectangle would be a little bit bigger than 36, so I'm pretty satisfied that our integral looks correct.